Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 209, our lecture on holiness. We're going to pray. We're going to get started. Charles wants to know how many countries are here. Uh, I'm not sure, Charles. <laughs> uh, maybe at least five or six or seven, five, six, maybe. Um, but let's pray and get started. Who would like to pray with the class today? Go ahead, Anita. Go ahead. Please pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Father God. Father, we give you glory and praises for this precious time, O oh Lord, Father. Father, Lord, such a privilege, O oh Lord, Father, to learn from your word, to study your word, Dada. Dada, as we learn about holiness, O oh Lord, Father, let us, O oh Lord, Father, help us to comprehend, O oh Lord, Father. It is beyond our comprehension, O oh Lord, Father. It is beyond our understanding, O oh Lord. Open our, O Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, understanding. Open our, O Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, spiritual eyes to see, O Lord, Father, Almighty, O Lord, Father, your words, O Lord, reverence for God is the treasure of man, O Lord, Father. Father, Lord, help us, O Lord, Father, to find that reverence, O Lord, Father, Almighty, O Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, enlighten us with your word, we pray. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, and good morning, everyone, once again. Welcome. We are going to continue our uh, study on holiness. All right, I'm just sharing uh, the PDF that we have uh, put out in the class work section. Uh, we'll just quickly review what we covered in our lecture on Monday, and then we will go forward from there. So we were, we are in chapter one, where we were talking about getting a revelation of a holy God, that about the fact that God is holy. So what we emphasized or mentioned is that just as we are familiar with other attributes of God, God of love, goodness, power, wisdom, healer, and so on, we also must get a revelation of the holiness of God. And we said, of course, this revelation comes to us from the Holy Spirit himself, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He is the one who gives us the knowledge of him. So we have to welcome the Holy Spirit to bring this revelation to our hearts and uh, enlighten our eyes to see God as holy. But this revelation of God is very important because only when we have a correct revelation is there going to be a correct response from us. And only then will we yield ourselves to have his nature reproduced and revealed through us. So receiving that revelation of the holiness of God is going to eventually lead us to the place where his holiness is reproduced in us. So one of the things we stated in the earlier class is we must understand that holiness, the, the right way for holiness to be formed in us is through revelation. Yes, there is, you know, the divine disciplinary dealings of God in our lives, which we will talk about later. That means God works in us by his spirit and, uh, and refines us and brings us into this place of holiness. But really, it must start with revelation. If it doesn't start with revelation, but it's just something that's enforced on us by rules and, you know, uh, all those kinds of things, which we discussed last class, then it is something we do just as an outward form, but there is no real life transformation that conforms us to holiness. So receiving the revelation of God, of his holiness is so important, even for us to have his holiness reproduced in us. The other thing we mentioned was that um, a reverence for God is birthed out of knowing the Holy One or knowing his holiness. 
And it is in this place of reverence that real wisdom and understanding is birthed. So it starts there. We, then we looked at um, Isaiah's experience or encounter with the Holy One of God. Uh, several things we said there is, you know, when Isaiah had this vision of God, he saw God being worshipped in his holiness. We will be building on that today. And his response was, I am undone. That means there's nothing more I can say, nothing more I can do. I'm as good as dead. But then it is God who imparts to Isaiah um, the, the ability to stand in his presence. The Lord removes his sin. And out of that comes the commission. He says, go for me. And Isaiah says, you know, I'll go. And what we see later in his ministry is um, his message to the people, his preaching and prophetic message to the people really brings a revelation of the Holy One of God. Because, you know, we said about 27 times he, he is talking about the Holy One. So what we said was, you know, out of that revelation of God's holiness, Isaiah is able to impart that to people through his preaching or proclamation. So a question we ask ourselves is, is our preaching and our ministry, whatever we are doing, is it really creating in people a sense of the holiness of God? And that can only happen if we've ourselves had a revelation of the holiness of God. So even in our ministry, receiving a revelation of the holiness of God is so important. And then we went on to say that God really desires for his nature to be reproduced in us. You know, and uh, just as uh, uh, he is he's a God of love, he wants us to walk in love. He's also a God of holiness and he wants us to be holy like him. And uh, so this is where we stopped. So I'm going to pick up from here today and uh, delve a little further into this subject. So when we try to, you know, maybe define or describe holiness, what is some language that we can use? And remember, we are trying to uh, communicate in our language uh, something that is so great, right? But at least to some extent, to some degree, we could try to understand. When we talk about holiness, we are talking about absolute sinlessness. You talk about absolute purity. You talk about absolute truth, because any kind of lie or untruth cannot be part of holiness. We're also talking about absolute faithfulness, because there is nothing that would violate a covenant or any form of unfaithfulness. We are also talk about absolute justice or fairness, equity, because there is no injustice in holiness. We talk about absolute love, because there cannot be anything of hate in holiness. We talk about absolute goodness. There's nothing unkind in holiness. We're talking about something that's absolutely sacred. There's nothing, there cannot be anything that's profane. We're talking about absolute perfection. So this is language we can use to try to capture in our minds what is this quality of holiness? Sinlessness, purity, truth, faithfulness, justice, love, goodness, something that's sacred, something that's absolutely perfect. And this is who God is. He is holy. 
And so this is the very nature of God. And therefore, what we must understand is that, and we have mentioned this earlier, that every facet of who he is, is mingled with holiness. Every facet of who he is, that means he's love, but his love is in the context of holiness or it is mingled with holiness. He is good, but his goodness is mingled with holiness. That means in his love, God is unable to express love in any form that would contradict holiness. God is unable to express goodness in any form that will contradict holiness. Because every part of who he is, he is completely holy. So every other attribute of God must be understood in the context of holiness or must we could put it like this, it's mingled with holiness. And this is important for us because sometimes we tend to isolate attributes of God that we like. A, a very common one would be grace. Is God a God of grace? Of course, he is a God of grace. He's the God of all grace. He's the God of all mercy. But his grace and his mercy is mingled with holiness. It's not outside of holiness. Holiness is an integral part of his grace. Holiness is an integral part of his mercy. So we can never, and we should never think of grace outside of the context of holiness. That means grace will never enable me to do something that contradicts holiness. But sadly, we don't think like that. And uh, many times in the Christian church, grace is used as a license to <laughs> sin. Oh, God is grace, you know, gracious. I'll just do something wrong and come back. But that's not an understanding, a proper understanding of grace. Because you, grace is never, the grace of God is never outside the context of holiness. God is completely holy and his grace must be understood in holiness. So this is very important to get a revelation of the holiness of God. Now, when we talk about the holiness of created things, that means us people or angelic beings or other things. So God is holy by his nature. That's who he is through and through. But in the holiness of created things like us people, it's a quality that's bestowed on us. It's given to us because we don't start out as holy. You know, we start out as sinful uh, and uh, imperfect and a lot of all the opposites of holiness. That's how we generally start out. But then God calls us to be holy and then he bestows on us this quality and this state of holiness. And one of the things that, I think it's a very simple, simple truth, but it's also very important. That for created things, to be holy simply means to be set apart to God. It's a very simple uh, biblical concept or understanding of holiness. But it's also very powerful. 
so in the holiness of created things like us people for us to be holy simply means I'm set apart to God to the one who is holy that's what it means set apart and when we say set apart we mean set apart in entirety completely to the one who is holy and because we don't start out that way but when that quality of holiness and the state of holiness is bestowed on us all it means is we've been fully set apart for God so this is understood when you look at the meanings of both the Hebrew and the Greek words uh, they are parallel words the Hebrew Kadosh or Kadesh and uh, the Greek Hagios. Uh, it simply means to be consecrated, sanctified, or set apart, um, dedicated for a particular use. So it's being set apart, sanctified for God. So within that understanding, we must recognize that it's when we are set apart for God, God is imparting to us his own nature, his own quality. He is giving us what he is. He is holy. He sets us apart for himself and then he gives us his own nature, holiness. So we understand holiness as God's nature being given to us. Therefore, it's not something, an outward form. It's not just an outward cleansing or making something appear clean on the outside. But it has to do with two things. It has to do with being set apart to God and us receiving his quality, his nature, his very nature. That's holiness. And if that doesn't happen, then we are really not holy from a biblical perspective. This outward cleansing, that means, you know, I just make myself look nice on the outside. Okay, okay, everybody, everything looks nice. Wow, well, this person is so holy. Well, it is actually not the kind of holiness that God has called us to. The holiness he's called us to involves two things. One is us being set apart and us receiving his nature imparted to us. And that's what we are looking to happen in our lives. So as we talk about later on in the third section, as we talk about overcoming sin, overcoming the flesh uh, 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 and, the, and the world and the devil, keep this in mind. We are not trying to achieve an outward form that may just, just look nice on the outside. That's not what we're trying to achieve. What we are pursuing, when you're pursuing holiness, we are pursuing a state where we are fully set apart for God and where his nature permeates our being through and through. That's what we are pursuing. Because this outward cleansing uh, sometimes is possible even by an unsaved person. You know, through a lot of self-discipline and other uh, um, the strength of the human will 
that they're able to have some form of outward, you know, uh, cleanliness. Yeah, that person, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that, he doesn't eat this, he doesn't eat that, he doesn't drink, he doesn't go here, he doesn't do, oh, okay, so, you know, outwardly very, very clean. But no one knows what's on the inside. That doesn't, that doesn't qualify for the biblical understanding of holiness. Another interesting understanding of holiness is, so when we look at uh, Exodus 28, verse 2, it says, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So God is saying, make holy garments. So again, this is now the garments the priest was going to wear. But the purpose of those garments was to show glory and beauty, to display. And in other places in scripture, uh, we see, you know, Psalm 29 verse 2, give the Lord, give unto the Lord glory due to his name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You see it again in Psalm 96 verse 9, the beauty of holiness. So this is an interesting observation that there are different metaphors for different attributes of God. So for example, the Bible uses the hand of the Lord to talk about the power of God. It uses eyes of the Lord to talk about his all knowing. The year of the Lord to talk about he hears our prayers, the face of the Lord, to refer to his presence, the feet of the Lord, to refer to his dwelling place or place of dominion, the mind of the Lord, to refer to his wisdom and understanding. But what we are seeing in the scriptures here, in these scriptures is that the metaphor of beauty is connected to holiness. Hand, power, eyes, omniscience, ear, prayer, face, presence, feet, dominion, mind, wisdom, beauty, holiness. So the beauty of God, or you could say the attractiveness of God, is holiness. So holiness is God revealing and expressing his beauty, his splendor, his magnificence, his attractiveness. Or let's put it like this. The holiness of God makes God attractive and therefore should draw us to him and is not intended to push us away from him. And somehow in our human understanding, whenever we talk about holiness, you know, it's like something that drives us away from God. But actually, it's the opposite. It's the beauty of God. It's the attractiveness of God. And so holiness should draw us to him and say, whoa, I want that. It's so beautiful. It should capture us. It should enthrall us. It should make us fixated on God. Not uh, make us afraid of God and drive us away from God. No, 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 no. This is the beauty of God. The holiness is the beauty of God. So, a correct revelation of God, a correct revelation of the holiness of God, 
will draw us closer to God. It will make us enthralled with God, fixed on Him. Now, another aspect of the holiness of God, and I think we've mentioned this already, is that um, the holiness of God is something that is way beyond our ability to comprehend or uh, describe. Exodus 15, 11 says, you are glorious in holiness. Glorious in, well, that means God, you are so wonderful in holiness. And so this is, uh, this is beyond what we can uh, describe. Your glorious and holiness. Or for Samuel 2, 2 says, there's no one holy like the Lord. Uh, there's nothing else that we can compare, you know, or even try to measure. You know, he is he himself is the standard. He himself is the perfection. And it's beyond our ability to fully comprehend and explain. But as we continue, we can progressively understand little more, little more, little more of the holiness of God. And the more we, like we said earlier, the more we understand about the holiness of God, the more attractive God becomes to us. So God, this is too much. This is wonderful. This is too good. Glorious in holiness. You, you, we become more in love with God. So while we know that we cannot fully describe and comprehend His holiness because He's glorious in holiness, the more we understand, the more in love we become with God. Right? So, He is absolutely holy. And um, I think we've uh, already mentioned this, that uh, the holiness of God and the goodness of God should be held uh, side by side. So there is the goodness of God and there is also the severity of God. And this is something uh, you know, I'm just mentioning here, and I've, I know I mentioned it a little earlier as well, is something we must never forget. There is the goodness of God, there is the holiness of God. And they meet, they meet. So, Psalm 85, 10 was, Psalm 85 verse 10 says, mercy and truth have met. Or righteousness and peace. Or righteousness and justice. Or grace and truth. Right? So there is grace, there is truth. Mercy and truth meet. So, in His mercy, or in His grace, God is willing to forgive sin. He's willing to cleanse sin. And in His holiness, He requires that only what is holy can come into His presence. 
can stand before him. And yes, the Bible says that, you know, mercy triumphs over judgment. But we must never forget that, that if we don't embrace the mercy of God, then the other side is the holiness of God or the judgment of God. So both are there in, in God, his mercy, his truth, his goodness, his severity. And it is his mercy and his grace that forgives. But if I don't want his mercy and grace, then I have to try to match up and you know, qualify for being holy, which I cannot do on my own. And that's where judgment comes. So goodness and holiness of God have to be understood together. We have already mentioned that. And in talking about receiving a revelation of God, when we see different people who had an encounter with God, whether it's Isaiah or Jacob, see how awesome his displays, or Moses, when he encountered God, God said, you know, Moses, got to take your sandals off. Other times Moses bowed his head to the earth. Joshua fell on his face to the earth. Ezekiel, Daniel, and John, they, they were down on their faces like dead men. What we say is that, and which we have said earlier, a true revelation of God completely, or we become completely undone in the presence of a holy God. That means there's nothing more I can say and nothing more I can do when I receive a revelation of the holiness of God. I say, God, you are everything. There's nothing about me that I can boast about, uh, nothing about me that I can brag about, because you are perfection. And before you, I am undone. So these are some thoughts here about the revelation of God. We're going to build on this further in the next chapter. And then the subsequent chapter, we talk about that holiness being brought into us. Uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions or any thoughts here. Let me, all right, I have, um, there's Divya and there's Samuel. Please go ahead, um, Divya and, and Samuel, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so uh, when we say uh, the very nature of God is holy, I was trying to uh, recollect uh, any uh, like verses um, because most of the attributes, there's a like a Hebrew name associated uh, with uh, like the El Shaddai or El Olam, El Roy. Mm -hmm. So is there a Hebrew name uh, that God is revealing in the Bible? Well, well the name that um, uh, he, he, he refers to him as himself as Jehovah Mekadesh. So the Lord, our sanctifier, the, the Lord who makes us holy. So that, and we will be saying that, um, that, is in the context of holiness, the Lord of a sanctifier, the Lord who makes us holy. Uh, so that's one I can think about. Yeah. Okay, okay, Pastor. And uh, I also was thinking of uh, uh, this portion where uh, uh, the Israelites are instructed to uh, keep uh, the Sabbaths. Uh, hmm. So is there a 
relation between that holiness of God and remaining in God's rest. Thank you. Hmm. Interesting question. Is there a relation uh, between holiness and remaining in God's rest? Well, uh, uh, at this point, the thing I, what I can think of is that really, um, I can think of, you know, in the context of obedience, um, that means whether it's the Sabbath or whatever else God has called us to do, uh, from our side, holiness means I'm set apart for God, which means I do what God has told me to do. Right Now, for the people in the Old Testament, yeah, Sabbath was uh, an important thing. For us, it's resting in God, uh, coming into that place of rest in God, and God teaches us to do that. So I would look at it, I mean, right now, when I think of your question, I would think of it in terms of obedience, you know, that uh, in connecting holiness to resting, uh, it's an act of obedience. So I'm setting myself apart for God, out of obedience to his word because he instructed us to rest in him and that is part of uh, our expression of holiness that's what comes to my mind right now i hope sure. that answers you sure Pastor. thank okay. you thank you let's take up um, we have samuel then we have mangi and then we have rupa please go ahead um thank you pastor um so, Pastor, with um, all that we are learning today and even in the last class, um, the verse that keeps coming back is, uh, be holy as I am holy. Um, and uh, so in, in that context, um, you know, as we see that we, you know, it's, it's only God who is the source of holiness and as humans we are not. So it's, it's something that we acquire or we progress in and uh, you know as you mentioned uh, the the outer can be attained with discipline but that's that's not the real deal you know that could be helpful beneficial so it's it's the inner and then again so so what i'm getting tangled is you know there is there is like a complete sinner like people who met god uh, peter when he realizes who Jesus is, mm. he also is in a way, you know, shown how sinner, like the sinfulness of his own nature. Therefore he says like he says, step away from me for I'm a sinful man. Mm. So so I'm thinking like a com for a complete person who doesn't I mean when God's holiness is revealed, yeah, you know, like you said, uh, it should be something that should attract us and not drive us away. But I'm thinking, like, one reason why it drives because we we get reminded of our own unholiness and of our own shortcomings, and therefore we want to, we don't want to encounter something that's so pure. Mm. That, and then um, the other thing is, um, I know, I, so 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 the outer holiness can be attained probably with effort and discipline. Like I don't drink, I don't go there, I don't see this. The inner, um, the, the nature of sin, the, so there's the component of faith like uh, that only with what Jesus did uh, can I be sinless. Mm. So, so it's, it's me believing that. But then again, um, I, I, so, I'm, I'm, so, so I believe that and, and that uh, is uh, uh, that's something that assures me that uh, God has made me sinless and God can God's the only one who can make me holy uh, but and and then but then again James says faith without works is dead so so now I so I need to pursue that holiness so and hopefully maybe in the later courses we will learn about how to 
pursue the holiness. But uh, what I'm so the the whole I'm like this verse that I get reminded of is "Be holy as I'm holy," and I'm thinking how. Like, mm. It's definitely not the outer one; it's the inner one, and there's the mm. faith component. Uh, but then knowing like knowing God's holiness, the more I know God's holiness, and the the more I get reflected of my own unholiness, and then the journey that I need to make to to fulfill that verse and and then just how do i begin that journey so so these are thoughts that i um mm. Mm. thank you for yeah good 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 so um you know what what you're described is really the journey we intend to make in this course so we all start out like that we are you know we are sinners now like you said because of that of course we are very uh, scared to stand in the presence of god who's absolutely holy but then we get saved and he imparts to us this state of being righteous so now we go from being sinners to being saints he gives to us this uh the capacity to stand in his presence it's bestowed on us it's given to us so from then on we are no longer fearful but we get attracted to this hey i want more of this i want to know this god who is so holy so perfect he so beauty and we get attracted to him and that whole process draws us away from the world so so if you just imagine as we are drawing close to him we are becoming more like him holiness is being perfected in us because we are drawn towards him but there is our part and this is what you were asking or you are talking about on and and i'll just reference a few verses but we are going to get into that in section 3 section 2 and section 3 section 2 talks about repentance which is where you know we begin this journey or whenever we need to we have to start there and section 3 we're dealing with overcoming overcoming the flesh the world and the devil three things that really pull us down three things that really keep us all of us from pursuing holiness the flesh the world the devil but we can overcome you know we can overcome so there's our part and and i just reference you know uh, paul writes to timothy he says if a man will cleanse himself from whatever is dishonorable he will be a holy vessel so that means i have my part to play and i cleanse myself from whatever is dishonorable before god and i become a holy vessel sanctified and fit for the master's use and ready for every good work you know so that's what we all want to be a useful vessel but part of that process paul said is hey cleanse yourself so that cleansing ourselves part is what we want to learn but the good news is god empowers that cleansing work for us he empowers us and he gives us the strength so it's a it's a little different from outward outward cleanliness that is achieved by self will it is good i'm not saying you know people who are able to do that okay wonderful but it's not the same as the kind of holiness the bible is calling us to because it's an an impartation of his nature as well as us being set apart for god and it's empowered in us by his word and by his spirit and that's where as believers we need to learn how to receive that empowering to cleanse ourselves from whatever is dishonorable so that we can be holy vessels useful for the master so that journey is what we are making in this course yeah good 
Okay, two more. We have Mangi and then we have Rupa, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, you've asked, answered most of, of the question I had. So, uh, but I have one, one, one more question that I'd like to ask is, when uh, elders of Israel went and ate with God, and it said that they saw God's uh, foot, footstep, or feet, Does it, can you say that it means that they didn't see God's place, but they saw his dominion or his, the place where his dominion or his glory was manifest, manifested or manifesting itself? Thank you, sir. So, um... Yeah, 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 you're saying that when the people of Israel, the elders, leaders of Israel, they saw the place where God's feet were, does it all always mean, does it mean they saw his, well, um, okay, maybe I can respond to it like this. Uh, you see, the, um, the visible expression of God, uh, that, that people have had different encounters with the visible expression of God. Sometimes they, you know, it's a pillar of cloud or a fire or uh, different forms. And so in this particular case, and I forget the exact reference, but I think it's in Exodus or Deuteronomy, I forget. But when they see the feet, um, maybe, okay, uh, they, that's how God revealed himself to them. Uh, and what did it communicate to them? Uh, did it express God's dominion, God's power? Uh, perhaps, I'm not sure. Uh, let me just quickly look up that. I, and I, I can't remember that. Um, uh, very well right now, as so I'm just trying to look it up. Um, yeah, this is Exodus 24, verse 10. It says, they saw the God of Israel there, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. So Exodus 24, 10. So that's the reference. They saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And, um, and upon the nobles, the next verse, Exodus 24, 11, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, and they saw God and did eat and drink. Um, yeah, it doesn't tell us here uh, what kind of reaction, you know, uh, they had in this encounter. I, you know, if it had told us that, uh, we, we could have said, um, you know, um, uh, that this was what they felt in Exodus 24, 10 and 11. Uh, it just says they saw his feet, they saw, you know, everything so clear, so majestic. Um, uh, God didn't, you know, lay his hand on them, but doesn't tell us, you know, how, how they responded, how they reacted, it just didn't record it for us. Um, but let's say, let's say, and this, this is my imagination at work. Let's say that when they saw this, they were struck with awe and wonder. So what did they see? They saw the feet on this clear crystal, uh, you know, glass-like thing. 
It doesn't tell us what, how the response was, but I'm just using my imagination. So they, they must have, whoa, you know, stuck in awe and wonder, this is how great God is, something, you know, whatever that response was. Um, uh, that would have, you know, given us a better understanding that, wow, this is the response that was evoked from them when they saw the feet of God. And perhaps they must have said, wow, how great, how mighty, how powerful, you know. So uh, I know your question was, does a feet always represent his place of dominion? Maybe that's, that may have been their sense, okay? But it doesn't tell us there, so I cannot be, you know, very certain. I cannot say those words with uh, absolute confidence. Hope that's okay, Mangi. Uh, yes, that is. Thank you. All right, uh, we are out of time. Uh, and I know you have to get ready for the next class. I don't want to hold you all up. Uh, Rupa, would, was it okay if you take up your question in our next class next week? Sure, sir. It's just small. Uh, I wanted to just uh, share something. I will do it next week. Thank you. Okay. Next Thank class. You. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, we will quickly close uh, because we've already taken time and you need to have a little break. Could somebody just pray with us quickly? We will, you know, we will continue this next week and uh, delve further in. Come here, could somebody pray and then dismiss the class, please? I'll pray. I'll pray. Go ahead. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for unchanging nature jesus and we we are grateful Lord, to be given this wisdom and understanding of how you who you are and how you operate and we pray jesus that you reveal yourself to us so that we will be changed and become more like you be with us until we meet again next week in jesus name amen 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 thank you all right, everyone. God bless you all. Uh, have a quick break, and then uh, you'll continue with the next class. I'll see you all next week. Enjoy the rest of the week and the weekend. God bless you. See you soon. God bless you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank God you. bless you, everyone. God bless.